Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to our second week of our Advent devotional live here on Facebook. Uh, I'm just going to talk for a little bit here at the beginning to uh, welcome all of you while everyone's getting tuned in. Uh, if you're having any troubles with the feed, um, leave a comment. If you're watching, leave a comment. Let us know that you're here. Uh, we're so glad that you can uh, tune in right now wherever you are uh, for this time of devotion and reflection, uh, turning our eyes, our ears toward God uh, so that we might be guided through this Advent season. Um, we're in our series called Ask, Seek, and Knock uh, for these Wednesday devotionals. And so we're, uh, we talked about last week about how we uh, ask God for what we need and today we're going to be talking about seeking after God in this uh, second week of Advent. Uh, as we turn our time here at the beginning to a time of prayer, I want to remind you that uh, the prayers at the beginning are coming from Phyllis Tickle's uh, Christmas Tide Divine Hours book right here. Uh, I'll be reading from this um, for our time of prayer. And uh, as we come to our time of prayer, there will be uh, a response uh, when I say, uh, and the people said, um, or the people say, uh, come Lord Jesus. Uh, so there'll be a couple times in our time of prayer that I'll lead us in that refrain. As we get our hearts and minds ready for this uh, brief time of uh, worship to God and reflection um, and uh, personal devotion. Uh, I have a candle here that I'm going to light to remind me and to remind us of the Holy Spirit's presence. If you have a candle in uh, the place where you are right now, I encourage you uh, to do the same, even if it's just an electric candle um, with no risk of fire. Um, that's a good way to remind yourself that God is present, uh, that you're taking particular time out right now uh, in prayer and devotion um, to put some other things aside. Okay, well, so let's begin now our time of prayer uh, from the Divine Hours. Uh, the Midday Office for this Wednesday on the second week of Advent. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for God made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Lord God, remember not our past sins. Let your compassion be swift to meet us. And the people say, Come, Lord Jesus. Zion hears and is glad, and the cities of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. And the people say, Come, Lord Jesus. Our scripture reading this morning is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40. I'll be reading verses 1 through 11. Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. The prophet says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed." and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? 
All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are like grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of glad tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up and do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And in response to the reading, the people say, Come, Lord Jesus. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts toward him. The midday psalm is from Psalm 31. How great is your goodness, O Lord, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have done in the sight of all those who put their trust in you. You hide them in the covert of your presence from those who slander them. You keep them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of his love in a besieged city. Love the Lord, all you who worship him. The Lord protects the faithful, but repays to the full those who act haughtily. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. And the people say, Come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to pray. Merciful God, who sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance, and prepare the way for our salvation. Grant us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Direct me, O Lord, in all of my doings with your most gracious favor, and further me with your continual help, that in all my work begun, continued, and ended in you, I may glorify your holy name, and finally, by your mercy, obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. And the people said, come, Lord Jesus. Well, we haven't had time uh, for an intercession of uh, prayer for specific concerns in uh, this initial time of prayer this morning. I invite you, uh, if you have some public concerns that you would like to share, you can leave those in the comments. You can also go to parisico.net and under the Grow in Faith tab, you can find a prayer page where you can submit prayer requests and our staff and our church will pray for those as we are directed. As we uh, transition from our time of prayer to our devotional reflection, uh, I want to read um, Part of the Nicene Creed uh, this morning uh, about Jesus Christ as our confession of faith. Um, if you know it, you can uh, read along with me or you can uh, pull it up on your computers there. Uh, but just the portion about Jesus and the Nicene Creed. May we believe these words. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, 
God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. These words we profess as a church in the hopes that we might believe them, that they might be internalized in our hearts, and that even when we doubt, the church might confess them for us. Okay, well, last week we jumped into the book of Isaiah together as we considered what it means to ask God for what we need so it would be given to us, as Jesus promises. And I encourage you, if you missed last week's devotional, to find it on Facebook or on our YouTube page, because that's really where I set the stage for this Advent series and uh, what we're going to be talking about. Jesus tells us, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and and you will find knock and the door will be opened. So this week we're going to seek so that we might find. And since we've already teased the theme of peace in worship on Sunday, I thought it would be good to illustrate uh, our seeking today with a story about peace that also illustrates what it means for us to seek after God. Well, this year, those of you who are inclined to be students of history um, have probably done a bit of thinking about the year 1918. Culturally, the 1918 H1N1 flu pandemic has a lot to teach us about our current struggle about, uh, against COVID-19. Some of the same problems in fighting that pandemic are still true today. But if you're thinking in the wider context, the 1918 flu hit the world hard right at the end of World War I. And it is that war and the censorship of media in that time everywhere except Spain about uh, that flu pandemic and its terrible effects that has given the pandemic the misnomer of being the Spanish flu uh, because the Spanish media was the only uh, state media that was allowed to report on it. Anyway, we're going to be thinking four years uh, before that pandemic to the year 1914, the first year of what was then called the Great War, or the war to end all wars, as it was said at the time. Well, the war had started, I believe, in the summer, and on December 7th, 1914, almost exactly 106 years ago, Pope Benedict XV, with an eye toward the promises of the Advent and Christmas season, and with the Christian hope of peace, suggested a temporary hiatus of the war to celebrate the Christmas season. It was not that preposterous of a suggestion. This was not in large part a war bet between nations of different religious allegiances. The vast majority of Europe in the early 20th century was Christian, and in large part in each country that participated in the war, the various Christian traditions, Catholic and Protestant, united behind their national cause. There were Christians on both sides of that conflict that used their faith in Jesus Christ as a source of inspiration and guidance, and even justification for their military engagement. Well, you would imagine that in such a conflict, both sides would have been able to say publicly and from the highest levels of government, we will pause the war for a Christmas peace. Because they had a common understanding of the Christmas holiday. And if some temporary peace was possible among competing nations, surely this was it. And yet, there was no official ceasefire in December of 1914. That still didn't stop the fact that war-weary soldiers, both British and French and German, um, were going to celebrate the birth of the Prince of Peace, 
They were going to celebrate Christmas no matter what. And so on Christmas Eve 1914, without any pre-planning or communication between sides, troops all across the theater of war began singing Christmas carols in their language. And as night fell, you could hear the kingdom of God. Men of different nations were singing praises to Jesus in their own language, sometimes even accompanied by bagpipes or brass bands. No one was going to take up their gun on Christmas Eve, no matter how committed they were to the cause of war, or no matter how hard the threats from their superiors. For one night in that dreary war, there was peace. But this isn't where the story ends. The peace of Christmas Eve uh, 1914 did not come without risk. Um, it was something both sides could practice without leaving their trenches and guns. Or on Christmas Eve, it did come without risk. They could sing carols in their trenches uh, without leaving them. But as we're talking about today, real peace requires risk. It requires actively seeking after justice and righteousness. Real peace requires us to get off of our butts and do something. And so as Christmas Day broke on uh, Christmas 1914, having heard the enemy carols the night before, a few German soldiers took a risk. They actively sought a Christmas peace. They arose from their trenches and approached the Allied lines across the liminal space between the trenches called No Man's Land. And they cried out, Merry Christmas, in the native tongues of their enemy. Just take a moment to consider the significance of such an act, of the proclamation of Merry Christmas in the language of the other. The Allied soldiers were cautious. They were fearing a trick. War conditions men to fear such things, but the enemy was unarmed, and so they too arose from the trenches and shook their enemy's hand. On Christmas Day, two men who could have killed each other the, the day before were exchanging presents of cigarettes and plum puddings. The words of Isaiah chapter 11 ring in our ears as we hear that story. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the falling, falling together, and the little child shall lead them. A German lieutenant recalling the event mused how marvelously wonderful yet how strange it was. The English officers felt the same way about it. Thus Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to bring mortal enemies together for a time. For a time is the key phrase in those words. As Christmas Day ended, fighting once again broke out so that by New Year's, the temporary truce was a distant memory. Never again would such a peace take place in war. Military officers made sure of it by threats of discipline. The powers and the principalities would never make the same mistake of allowing a Christmas peace again. In fact, the powers would de further delay the possibility of a true peace, for we know that the Great War was not the war to end all wars. Rather, it was only the embers of an even terrifyingly greater war. World War I would be overshadowed by the horrors of World War II. Still, this memory of seeking after peace and justice reverberates in our imagination at Christmas as we anticipate the coming again of the Prince of Peace. And so now you're asking yourself, what does this have to do with our reading from Isaiah 40? Well, it turns out, as you look at the context of that chapter, quite a lot. This text, scholars tell us, is at the beginning of the second part of Isaiah's text. The Assyrians have destroyed most of the kingdom of Judah and have laid siege to the holy city of Jerusalem. Isaiah, too, is telling us about the middle of a war. But more than that, there is a temporary peace in Isaiah's world. The Assyrian king Sennacherib has had bigger issues going on at home. And so he recalls his troops to Nineveh. Isaiah's comfort, O comfort my people, comes after this first siege by Assyria and before the later destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Babylon in 587 BC. 
You'll remember from Kelly's sermon on Sunday that it is because of Jerusalem's destruction in 537 BC that Daniel ends up exiled in Babylon, unable to return home. Isaiah 40 then comes at this liminal space between violent attacks. It is a message of peace that arrives both in the aftermath and anticipation of conflict, much like the Christmas truce of 1914. Isaiah, as he did when he received his divine commission in chapter 6 and said, Here I am, Lord, send me, he has now once again entered God's divine counsel. Isaiah has entered the heavenly court where there is discussion about these earthly conflicts. God speaks uh, for his divine messengers, we might call these angels, to comfort, O oh comfort my people. And a divine messenger or angel chimes in and says, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. And finally, another messenger, another angel, instructs Isaiah to cry out to people on earth this message. All people are grass, but the word of our God will stand forever. As we consider our imperative to seek so that we might find, it is this imperative in verse 3 that is most crucial. Prepare. It is the task of the Advent season to prepare. It is not enough for us to ask God for what we need, but we must also prepare the way for the arrival of the answer to our prayers. Well, this divine messenger or angel is instructing us to go out from where we are to blaze a new trail through an overgrown land. We're instructed to seek a new way that is different from the old way. We are to seek this new way in order to prepare the path for the arrival of the one for whom we are waiting, to prepare the path for God himself. If you've ever gone hiking, you can visualize this pretty clearly. Normally, to respect the land we are on, we stay on the marked trails. We follow uh, the markings on the trees that are blue or red or white. Someone has already blazed these trails for us by clearing the vegetation and putting up those markers. The path may not be level, but it is largely free of debris. But if we want to seek after something that is new, we cannot take the old trails. Like Lewis and Clark's core of discovery, we must chart a new course, veer off of the path, to clear a way through the vegetation, through the mountains and the valleys, to lay down the mountains and lift up the valleys. The old trail can only take us to the same places it's always taken us. A new trail can lead us to find what we have been asking for and seeking after. Well, like the route of the core of discovery, the path being charted in Isaiah's time is not an ideal route. Lewis and Clark never found a water route to the Pacific. And likewise, Isaiah's route for God's people is a wilderness route. It is dangerous. Most people would avoid traveling on it. And yet, this wilderness route is the difficult, painful way through which God's people will one day return from their suffering in Babylon. They will go in this time of comfort back to their home. When this text appears again in the mouth of John the Baptist in, in the New Testament, the way of the Lord being prepared is similarly challenging. Not many want to openly air out and confess their sins. Right? So the people who follow John initially are quite hesitant because they've been hiding their sins for a reason. But as the crowds gather and gather, uh, people begin to take this road of repentance because they see others doing so. Or maybe it's politically expedient for them. And uh, John notably calls these a brood of vipers, those who line up in a crowd only because they see a crowd there. They don't actually know what it is that they're supposedly seeking after. 
Well, this risky wilderness road in Isaiah, figured more completely for us in the gospel of Jesus Christ, was once again figured in this Christmas truce of 1914. Two sides of men were entrenched in the old ways of war and bloodshed, the old ways in which we still live. In between them lay this no man's land, a wilderness they had not before dared to travel, because traveling it meant certain death. But by doing so, by blazing this new path between the trenches, soldiers of opposing size, sides found temporary peace. And it is, as Kelly preached to us on Sunday, our Advent faith requires us to be active, not passive consumers. Charting a new course takes risk. It requires guts. And it takes us risking getting out of our trenches and rising to the occasion. And here's what I think is perhaps the most important lesson of this pandemic. You and I were long stuck in a groove in a trench much like uh, the trenches of war, or like the grooves in a vinyl record, right? They go around and around and around, and so long you begin to wear into it that it begins skipping a beat. So the record that was once nice to listen to is uh, no longer doing its purpose. It's, it's skipping a beat. The longer we did things the old way, the more and more we dug a trench of safety. We dug ourselves into a trench of protection and stagnation. A soldier who never leaves the trenches is one who has died in the trench. Well, the pandemic has revealed the groove of life in the BC time, the before COVID time, to be a rut, to be a trench. And right now, all of us cry out in one voice, Come, Lord Jesus, because we need to be freed from this trench, this rut, this groove. We want to be freed from being stuck at home. And so we ask God to come through the uncharted territory because we know the old ways, BC, before COVID, were not working. Because if we're honest with ourselves, in those times, we did not love God with our whole heart. We as a church were not fully obedient to God's way. We did not do God's will. In fact, in our old ways, we actively broke God's law. We have rebelled against God's offer of free grace. We have not loved our neighbors, nor heeded the cry of those who are in need. And it is because of this, because the old ways were not working for us, that we now daily cry out for God to make a new way where there was no way. Last week's Advent reflection could be summed up in a paraphrase of the first three steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I can't, God can, so let him. I can't do it, God can do it, and so let us let him do what we cannot. Together we must admit that we were powerless over the powers and principalities. We were powerless over sin. Our lives had become unmanageable, even if we didn't struggle with a deadly addiction. The virus had so fully infected us that we were blind to its effects. We were in the trenches expecting to die there, but God can deliver us, church. No, God will deliver us. That deliverance begins when we start seeking a new way. It comes when we see the trench for what it is and take those first few risky steps through the wilderness road, the land where few men and women would dare to go. Let us seek a new way together, that we would find a future of peace and justice, a future that some would say is impossible. But through God, all things are possible, even a peace that will last. In the name of the God who can do infinitely more than we could ask or imagine, we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing when this is all over. 
once again into our doors. The peace of Christ be with you all. Amen.